one of the things that really struck me over the last few weeks was the way all the people that spoke to us or wrote to us about Chaya all mentioned the same exact thing. They mentioned about Chaya's beautiful smile, about her pure joy, about her tremendous energy, about her amazing positivity. And when everybody says the same thing, which I think is pretty unique, that everybody sees the same exact thing in a person, that shows that that person's midas, their characteristics, really shone through them. And that they lived their life in a way that was very clear how strongly they were in their good midos. I remember when I brought Chaya to the hospital after she had the recurrence a little over a year ago. It was a very difficult time, a very disappointing time. Chaya was doing very well for about 10 months. She was in school every day. She was having fun. She had plans for a summer overnight camp. And suddenly we got the news that really changed everything. She stopped going to school for a while. She had to cancel her summer plans. And it was just a very difficult time. And the first day that I brought her to the hospital to start her new treatment, she sat for a few hours and she decorated her room. I was amazed at what she did. She put up beautifully colored papers on her front door of her hospital room, as well as the walls inside her room. One of them said on it, before you enter this room, you must smile. Another one had a bunch of cut-out hearts taped on to the sign, and it said on bottom, please take one before you leave. Each heart had another message. Be happy, smile, be positive, things like that. This is someone that just went through a terrible, disappointing you know, news that she just got. And immediately she was able to change and become hopeful and optimistic again and change everybody's mood as well. (coughs) There is something that was very interesting about Chaya, that besides all of her fun, her enjoyment that she had in life, she was also very sensitive to her spiritual side. I once had a friend that came over to visit me at the hospital when I was staying there with Chaya. And we were staying, we were late at, it was late at night, we were sitting and speaking. And it became very late and Chaya came up to me and said that I would, it's, I'm getting tired, I want to go to bed. And she went to the sink and got Negovasa and brought it to her bed. A couple of weeks later, this friend called me from Israel, which is where he lives, and he said, that when I got back to Israel, I told my children, I said, I was just in a hospital in Los Angeles with a nine-year-old girl getting chemo treatments. And when she went to bed, she went and got Negelwasser and brought it to her bed. He said, you have no excuses not to do the same. And he told me that it was an amazing motivation for his children to start trying to do these things as well. Every Tuesday evening, Chaya was part of a program called Laugh and Learn, which is run by a woman in the community who gathers a lot of girls in her house and teaches them and then plays games with them. And Chaya was a big part of it. She would never want to miss it, never want to be late even. And sometimes on Tuesday, we would have to go into the clinic. And I remember every morning that she, every time it came out on a Tuesday, she would wake up early in the morning and rush to get dressed. And she would tell me, let's go there as quickly as we can because I don't want to even be late for one minute to the laugh and learn. There were times that we were running late and she would tell me, take me straight 
to the person's house, don't even take me home for supper, I'll eat later, but I don't want to miss anything. And this was after a rough day of either getting treatments or blood transfusions or things like that. But her connection to these type of programs and events, things that gave her spirituality and fun, that was what she was all about. That was her life. During the Shiva, a girl texted my wife or sent her a message that she was highest counselor in Camp Simcha. That's the camp that's run by, by High Lifeline in New York. And Chaya went there one summer, a couple of years ago. And she sent a message to my wife saying that Chaya was such an amazing girl that I learned much more from her that summer than I was able to give her. And one of the examples that she brought was as follows. One Shabbos morning, there was a terrible fire in the camp in one of the bunkhouses. And thank God they managed to get all the campers, all the counselors out safely. Everybody was fine. But the bunkhouse completely burned down to the ground. And I remember getting the phone call that night to let us know that everything is fine, that there was you know, a fire, but everybody's fine. But a couple hours later, the counselor sees Chaya walking across the yard and on her arm she has tons of her Shabbos clothing hanging over her arm, schlepping it across the yard. So she went up to her and said, Chaya, what are you doing? So she says, well, because it's Shabbos, the girls can't go out and buy new clothing yet. They're going to have to wait till tomorrow. And I don't want them to feel bad that on Shabbos they don't have nice clothing to wear. So I'm bringing them my clothes so that they should all have something to wear now. She said it so naturally, like this was something that's expected of every 10-year-old girl to be able to think of and do. <coughs> Shabbos was a very special day by Chaya. I think she must have learned it from her safta, who cherished Shabbos extremely, very much, and lived next door to us. And I remember what the Shabbos was like in her house. And Chaya would come right after, Shab right after lighting the Shabbos candles. She would gather the, gir the girls in the building and bring them to her Safta's house and sing with them L'chadaydi and other Shabbos songs to, br to bring in the Shabbos. In the morning, while most kids are sleeping in and, you know, just enjoying their not having to go to school, Chaya would wake up and as soon as she got up, she would start rushing to get dressed because she was part of a show called Kol of Yehuda, which is a show for children, and she definitely wouldn't miss being part of that. And so she would get dressed and want to leave as soon as she can the house so that she, she can get there on time and not have to miss anything. After she came home and we ate the Shabbos meal, many times she would gather the girls and the, and the kids in the building, and she would make them a Masiba Shabbos. This is a nine, ten-year-old girl that's just doing these things on her own. She would gather all the girls in our hallway and the little boys. She would bring out her nash, which she always had tons of, and share it with them and read them from the parsha or stories, say the 12 psukim with them, and just give them a very nice Shabbos afternoon. The last couple of years, she also man managed to many times go to our, our next door neighbor, Yitzhi Horowitz, who lives right next to us, and because of his medical condition, is not able to get out of bed. And on Shabbos, when he can't use his computer, it becomes very lonely. So she would gather some girls in the building, sometimes Yitzhi Horowitz's daughters also, and they would start to practice different songs and dances and they would go into his room and make him shows. She knew that there was somebody that was bored on Shabbos afternoon and needed somebody to, and some, needed some uplifting. And that's what she wanted to do. And this is going during the last couple of years when she herself was not doing very well many times and having difficult times herself. But yet she wanted to do the true Bikr Chaylam of going to somebody and lift them up on a Shabbos afternoon <coughs> so that they don't sit, you know, sit there forgotten.
this week's parsha, we read about Bahal Lesha Saneris, how Aaron Hakoyin would light the candles, he would raise the flames in the Besa Mikdash. And there's a known a famous Pasik in Tanakh, Nir Hashem Nir Hashem Nishma Sodom. That this that the candle of Hashem is the soul of man, of people. A couple of weeks ago a friend of mine living in China sent me a message. He has a daughter who's 12 years old and was friends with Chaya. They met in camp. And she would like when her father would make different gematrias. And so she asked him one day, could you make one for Chaya? So he sat and thought about it and then he came up with this. He said that Ner Hashem Nishma Sadam is the same exact gematria, the same equivalent as Chaya Mushka Shpalter, exactly her name, the way we spell it. And he ended his message saying, that Chaya's soul was truly a candle for Hashem, with all the meaning that it comes with. I was looking a few days ago in the Hayyim Yim, which is the first, I think, the first uh, Sefer that the Lubavitcher Rebbe published. And it's basically inspirational thoughts for each day of the year. And I wanted to see what it says on the day of Gimel Elul, which is the third of Elul, the day of Chaya's birthday. And so I opened it up, and I'm not going to read from the original, but I'm going to read the translation. This is what it says. Whoever has faith in individual divine providence knows that man's steps are established by God, that this particular soul must purify and improve something specific in a particular place. For centuries or even since the world's creation, that which needs purification or improvement waits for this soul to come and purify or improve it. The soul too has been waiting ever since it came into being for its time to descend so that it can discharge the tasks of purification and improvement assigned to it. This was written on the day of Chai's birthday and her soul definitely accomplished what it had to. Something that truly amazed me about the community is the reaction that the people had the last few weeks and ever since the tragedy happened when she passed away. There's a famous explanation from the Obava Cherebi about when Yaakov came down to Mitzrayim and met his son Yosef for the first time in 22 years after not seeing him and even thinking that he wasn't alive anymore. And suddenly he's told that his son is alive and he goes down to meet him. And the first time that they meet, the Torah says that Yosef fell on his father's shoulder and he cried. But the Torah doesn't say what Yaakov did. And so the question is, why didn't Yaakov react the same way to his son? And Rashi says that because Yaakov was then saying Kriyashma. And of course, the simple question is, what's that supposed to mean? He couldn't find a better time, couldn't choose a better time to say Krishna than right when he's about to meet his son, who he didn't meet in 22 years, never saw him, thought that he's not alive. It's the most amazing meeting he's ever going to have. And he chooses now to say Krishna. So the Obama Sharab explains it, that actually, yes, Yaakov Avinu chose this moment to say Shema, deliberately. Because the Messiris Nefesh, the self-sacrifice that Yaakov had in his service of Hashem, was so great that when he had this amazing emotional experience, this tremendous feeling of joy, of happiness, meeting his son after thinking that he wasn't alive, 22 years not seeing him, this was an experience, this was a feeling that he never had before and will never have again. And Yaakov decided that he wants to channel that amazing emotional feeling to express his love of Hashem. There will be nothing that he will do other than to serve Hashem in the best way possible. And so if he's going to have the most, exp- most amazing emotional experience of his lifetime, he wanted to make sure that he channels it towards his expression of, a, of his love to Hashem. And so that's why he started to say the Kriyashma as soon as he felt that emotional feeling. <coughs> Over the last few weeks, I feel like something similar has been happening in this community. 
it was a tragedy. A lot of people knew Chaya. A lot of people knew our family, know our family. And many people were down. And it could have been a time when people would feel sad and not motivated to really do anything. But yet the exact opposite is what happens. We've gotten hundreds, maybe thousands, of messages, calls, of people that said that they felt very emotional at this time. And they felt like they needed to do something positive, something positive for, for Chaya. And so instead of being sad, they instead turned to action. Many people recommitted themselves to their connection to Hashem. Many people brought out stronger their actions, their feelings. Some people by lighting Shabbos candles earlier, taking in the Shabbos extra early. Some people by reaching out to other people to start lighting Shabbos candles. Other people by having extra kavana during davening. Some people by starting a share and many different ways that people express to us how they decided to recommit themselves in a stronger way to a connection to Hashem. It's been an amazing awakening by many people what, got, what went on. A friend of mine actually mentioned to me that a couple of, for a couple of days after Chaya passed away, his 10-year-old daughter, who was good friends with Chaya, was having a very difficult time. And she felt broken and, you know, she couldn't get back to herself. And then after a couple of days, she came to her parents and said, I feel like I'm doing the wrong thing by being sad. Because every time that I was with Chaya, she was happy. She was always happy. And she always made me happy. And so I don't feel like it's right for me now to be sad because of her. And so I'm going to change and I'm going to try to be happy now because that's what she taught me. That's how you're supposed to live life. And this is something I think that we truly need to take away from tonight as well as from the last few weeks, the events that happened. To try to take the positivity that Chaya lived with, to take her amuna, her batachin, her happiness, and try to instill that in our lives as much as we can so that we live a better life in her honor and we continue to be positive in everything that we do until we are reunited with her by the revelation of Mashiach. There is a custom that because the word neshama has the same letters as the word Mishnah, so when somebody passes away, there's a custom that they learn Mishnayis on behalf of that person. This, uh, the entire Mishnayis was split up many times. Le'ili Nishmas Chaya, and first of all, I'd like to thank everybody that took Masechtas and did it. There was uh, all the, all the Bachran from Yeshiva Ketana of Rav Hanun Chabad, split the entire Mishnayis between them. All the Bachran from Yeshiva Gedeula of Rav Hanun Chabad did it as well. All the Bachram in Alatera, which is the Shiva in New York that I studied when I was a student, also split the entire Mishnayis. The Shluchim network split the entire Mishnayis between them, and my class split the entire Mishnayis between them as well. I took a few Masechtas from the Mishnayis of my class, including the last ones that I can make a Siyum. So I'll just take one minute to make a quick uh, Siyum. The last Mishnah of Mishnayis says, Amr Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Rabbi Yeshua, the son of Levi, said, Hashem will eventually 
inherit to every tzaddik, shleish meis v'asara ilmis, 310 worlds. Shnemar, as it says, l'hanchel oyeve yesh, that I will inherit to my friends yesh, which is 310, Amali, and I will fill up their storage rooms, their treasure rooms. Amr Rabbi Shimon ben Chalafta, so Rabbi Shimon ben Chalafta said, Hashem did not find a vessel that holds bracha for the Yidin, better other than shalom, than peace. Shinemar, as it says, Hashem oizlami yitain, Hashem yibarach atami bashalom. I just want to, I'm going to be speaking after Rabbi Jacobson, but I just wanted to come up and call up somebody very, very special. We are very honored that he came here tonight, and um, that is Dr. Cooper, the Chief of um, Oncology Pediatrics. Um, I just want to mention two specific points besides, and he's representing other doctors who wanted to make it but had other obligations. Besides their brilliance and everything amazing about them, two specific points that stuck out um, regarding the doctors was, number one, they, if I can use the word manipulated, the schedules for us many times, um, Shabbos, Yom Tov, holidays, they were unbelievable. Their understanding and support and care far exceeded our expectations, and they worked with us unbelievably at all times. And the second thing is that I didn't stop making them crazy with my emails. And any single thing that I asked them, let's try this, I heard of another trial here. I mean, they knew these things themselves. It was as if I was telling them something new. Um, can we try this? Can we try that? Does Kaiser do it? They never hesitated. They left no stone unturned. They worked with us unbelievably from beginning to end. And, you know, my first reaction was um, after this happened, I don't. I don't know if I can see them so quickly again. Not, not that anything is their fault. I don't know if I'm stepping into that clinic so fast again. But I would love to be in touch with them. They were involved in Chai's life so majorly. And I'm so honored that he's here. And I'm happy that we're emailing them and being in touch with them. I think Dr. Cooper is a little bit famous already in the Jewish world somewhat because of those mezuzah pictures that went around. And I could just imagine Chai here saying, Dr. Cooper, the mezuzah is just the beginning. Um, so, Dr. Cooper, come up and just say a couple of words. We'd be honored. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Thank you for the honor of coming and, and addressing your group on, on behalf of the doctors and nurses who, who care for Chaya. Um, this was a, a, a very, very hard two years. I, uh, we got to know Chaya, we got to know the family uh, very well during this time. We did not get to know Chaya before she got sick. Uh, while she was sick, she was uh, everything Mindy said. She was uh, sweet, uh, vibrant, um, just, just so pleasant. And, and what really kind of struck me about her was just how calm she was all of the time. Uh, when things were hard, she was calm. When things were uh, going easy, uh, she was calm. She, was, she loved doing the arts and, and, and the crafts. And just, just so, so sweet. Uh, she really touched uh, all of us in the, in the hospital and, and out in the clinic. Uh, I, I talked today and uh, we, were, we had a meeting with the, the resident house staff and, and I mentioned that I was, I was going to come out here tonight. And, uh, they, and I started hearing stories from them about the, you know, when I was an intern when, when she came in and you know, they, they were with her for the, the, the two years of, of her treatment and she really touched, touched everybody and uh, such a, a sweet, sweet girl. Um, this is a terrible, terrible thing for, for her to go through. It's a terrible thing for, for a family to go through to, to lose a child. And during this, the, the one thing that really impressed, upon, impressed me and, and, my, and, and uh, my colleagues and my partners was just the grace of the family and the strength of, of your community. Uh, Hyatt was, was never alone. Uh, there was somebody always with her each time in the clinic, each time in the, in the hospital. Uh, the, the support that, that we saw, it was really 
kind of breathtaking. Um, and, and I think the, the support from the community you know, played as much a role or and, and contributed to who she was as, the, as, as, her, as her family. It's because it's the love that she received from home, the love that she received from the community that made her such a grounded person and, and allowed her to go through uh, this time with, uh, with, with such grace. So, um, I, I just, again, I can't tell you how, how impressed I was with, uh, w with your community and, and, and with her family. And again, th thank you so much for, uh, for allowing me to, to, to participate in, in this memorial. Of thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. I started my introduction before but I'll say it once again. My wife and I are honored that Rabbi Jacobson, Rabbi Yassi Jacobson, agreed to come out here. He was a classmate of mine since, I think we're about four years old. Every year, until we, are, we were about 20 or 21, we were together in school every year. We were good friends and it was very, very generous of him to offer to, uh, to come out and speak at this uh, Shalatian event. And we thank him for coming and for being part of this. Rabbi Yassi Jacobson. 